speaking of magic, I know it's also science, but to me, it's magic. <laughs> Today I'm speaking to Janie Kodush. Janie is the author of the fascinating story which she has just published, The Elephant Doctor of India. Among many other titles, her study of the lives of conservationists, Wild Lives, was called inspiring and fascinating by no other than Dr. Jane Goodall. She is currently researching a work on the mighty but diminutive migratory hummingbird that she welcomes back yearly to her garden in New Mexico. Hi, Janie. Thank you so much for coming on to the Nature Magic podcast. Hi, thanks so much for having me. You're so welcome. Where are we speaking to you from today? I am in Santa Fe, New Mexico, USA, Southwest. Fantastic. And what I'd really love to start with is, would you like to tell us a little bit about your new book that's just been published? Yeah, thank you. So um, I just had a new book published called The Elephant Doctor of India. And it is a narrative nonfiction piece about um, Dr. Kushal Konwar Sarma, who's India's leading elephant doctor. And I call him um, a mix of Dr. Jane Goodall, Indiana Jones, and Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> wow. How did you hear about him? I heard about him. Um, through a friend of mine who I had worked for as a naturalist at the Montana Natural History Center in graduate school. And she and her family were living in Bhutan. Her husband's a conservation biologist. And Assam, India, where Dr. Sarma is, borders Bhutan. And so Lisa, um, who had contacted me, was doing a project with elephant conservation and reached out to me and said, hey, you know, do you want to write about this? And it took me about half a second to say, oh, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about the book. Okay, so, um, you know, the book was a very, it, it took, I went to Assam for three weeks um, and I, I visited, well, I went with Lisa um, and there was so much. Um, Assam has, well, India's got the largest amount of elephants, Asian elephants left in the world. and then. Assam has the largest amount within India. So you could say that Assam has the last viable population of Asian elephants. Yeah. And um, actually, before I went there, I had gotten to meet Dr. Sarma because he came to the United States to give a talk. And I at North Carolina, where Lisa and Scott were at the time. So I flew out there and I met him. And he is just the most charismatic fun to talk to, filled with stories um, of a life with elephants. And I thought, this is my story. Like, everybody needs to know about Dr. Sarma. He does things like, um, you know, he'll trek an elephant for 14 hours that's been injured, and he'll find it, and he'll capture it. He, you know, none of this, I mean, his work is as a veterinarian. He's a PhD. He teaches at a university. So all of this is outside of the scope of his work. Um, so the book is stories of, I, I took, I mean, I had hundreds of hours and interviews, um, kind of what I thought of as the key stories, key elephants that represented sort of different pieces of his work. And I, I patched those stories together over a chronological time. Um, but one thing I'd like to say about it, because, because they're different stories, I really wanted sort of a narrative arc. And there's this beautiful arc that unfolded um, naturally through the stories he told me that I won't give away in case anyone wants to read it. But I'll just say it's about an elephant that 14 years after he helped her remembered him. And it's, it's really a very, in my mind, a very emotional story that, that confirms this truth that we know that elephants have, they're very emotional and they have amazing memories. Oh, how wonderful. Because we were talking about the guy um, in Africa and I've forgotten the name of the book now, but Ramiro was talking about the guy who helped the herd of elephants. I'll get his name in a minute. And they were rampaging around breaking fences and everything, and they wanted to put them down. And he said, no, I'll try and sort them out. He tried to fence them and everything. Eventually, when he died, the elephants were wild at that stage. They all came back to his house and grieved for a couple of weeks. It's so, really incredible. They're incredible animals. Can you give us a little, one little mini bite from the book? 
Ah, yes, like a little reading from it. Oh, maybe a reading. That would be lovely if you want to, or or a little um, story from it, whatever you feel. Maybe I'll do a little story just because I, I hadn't um, thought of which section would be nice to read. Um, I think one of the stories, there's so many, but one of them that... Um, where to me, Dr. Sarma, I use the word famous. He is not famous <laughs> to me. He's, you know what I mean? Like nobody knows of Dr. Sarma except the elephants and the people in India who, um, but he's the kind of famous to me that, that really matters. Um, so I use that word, you know, in that, in that regard, but in 1994, um, and it's, it goes with what you were saying. So elephants go into something called must when the, the males get a surge of hormones and in the natural world, it's it's no different than a rut or something when the males are competing for females. Um, well, I don't mean in the natural world, I mean in the wild when they're not in captivity. So when they're in captivity and there's a large population, of course, um, things can happen where it leads to human elephant conflict and people getting killed. Sometimes the mahout, as they're called in India, um, the people that are the, the caretakers of the elephants don't recognize the signs of musk and the elephant escapes. So this elephant had escaped and the, the, man, the elephant's owner, um, the owner isn't the mahout, the owner hires the mahout, traveled, you know, 10 hours to find Dr. Sarma, said, please help me. And at the time, Dr. Sarma was, you know, pretty young. He was a vet. And he said, well, how can I help you? And he said, well, I heard for your PhD, you had studied sedation in elephants. And he said, yeah. So the man had said, well, I watched a National Geographic video where I learned that you can chemically sedate a wild animal. Well, Dr. Sarma had never done this before. He said, what the heck, I'll try. So he went to the zoo. He found this rusty old syringe projector and a dart, a tranquilizing um, dart. And the dart, as I write in the book, was the right size for a rhinoceros, not an elephant. He used it anyways. Um, you know, they, it's an opiate narcotic. So, you know, it's a dangerous medicine. Uh, you have to climb a tree. He knew he'd have to climb a tree. He wasn't a good cl tree climber at the time. Um, you know, so all of this, these odds against him, but he set out, you know, he loved elephants. He knew that the elephant would be killed um, and it could kill people. So he set out to track this elephant whose name was Manic. <laughs> oh, dear. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and he did. Um, and part of the story that I love in the middle of the, you know, sedation, he actually got someone else to climb the tree and he hid behind a rock. He was going to run out, you know, and sedate him. So the guy in the tree, they start calling my next name. He comes charging and Dr. Sarma says, oh, my God, he's going to hit the tree where this young man who's going to fire the gun and he's going to kill him. He's going to get thrown out of the tree. The man reacts. He throws out some um, seeds of some. Um, a fruit of an or some bananas that the elephant likes the elephant stops to eat Dr. Sarma sedates him and he's able to save this elephant uh, so after, yeah since then he has done this 139 times saved 139 elephants well thank you for bringing his story to the world it's you know it would have been a shame not to I agree. And, and yeah, I agree. I, I really, I think he has a wonderful story worth, if you love elephants and are passionate about conservation, it's worth reading. Great. I can't wait to get the book. So we'll go a little bit into your life and how you became a nature lover or what inspired you to work. I know you've, you're a, an author as well, and you've written some books for um, teenagers, some yes. thrillers. Are, are they yeah. thrillers kind of? And yeah, also true. nature books. Yes, 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 all of that. Um, <laughs> um, so I have three other books, um, and I'm working on a, so four now, working on some more. Um, even the two for teenagers, though, they're science-based. Um, I just love the natural world and science. And then one for adults um, called Wild Lives, that's about conservation. Um, but I guess I've just always loved animals, you know? I think I was just born that way. <laughs> Um, I grew up in upstate New York and I just remember, I, I just, you know, it, it's sad. It's poignant. Um, like so much of the world's, you know, that area, the places I remember aren't there anymore. Um, you know, they've been developed. I mean, there's, there were, there were, it was wet, it was marshy and there were pheasants and raccoons. And I would go out just with my dad and, and see these things that, you know, I remember in seventh grade having a project um, 
where we were supposed to go and explore an ecosystem. And we could just, you know, trek out from our house and there was this marshy area. And I still, my parents saved that project. You know, I pressed leaves and footprints of animals and um, I just loved it. I I, kind of turned away from it for a while, um, which I think is worth mentioning only because I'm also an educator. I'm an environmental educator and I got real turned off to science in high school. I thought it was so stupid and boring. (laughs) Um, and, and sort of the more creative part of me wanted to flourish, you know, the arts, which I finally found a way to, to merge those. But it wasn't until college that I realized all that stuff I loved, the natural world was science. You know, nobody made that connection somehow. I missed that. Like sitting in a classroom, I just missed that. And I just, I was a bad student, you know, I was like, I just didn't get it. So um it's so important now to me. I teach environmental science and ecology to inspire my students just to go, wow, if nothing else, I want them to go, wow. Fantastic. Yes, because part of the Nature Magic podcast within it, we have a series of nature educators. So mm-hmm. I know there's some people following um, for that branch oh, of the fabulous. podcast as well. So they'll hit they'll listen to you as well. That's wonderful because on your website, you do offer some to work with people on various things. Yes, yes. Have you got a favorite plant or animal? A favorite? I, oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I kind of tend to say whatever I'm seeing at the time. Um, but off the top of my head, it's a funny answer, maybe. But um, chickadees, which are like your, the, I think, at least in Scotland, I know because my husband's Scottish, you've got the bird, the tits, the blue tit. So chickadees are the same group. And um, I love them because they're they're so friendly and curious and they're everywhere. And every morning I go out and I put out my mealworms and there's always one waiting for me. And I really do feel like we know each other. <laughs> oh, that's so lovely. Have you had any spiritual experiences in nature that you'd like to tell us about? I feel like, you know, I'm, I've done a lot of backpacking. And to me, just being out there um, by myself or with my husband in the mountains is about the most spiritual experience for me that I can have. I just, I don't, I guess maybe a spiritual experience. This is part of it is I just don't even have words. It just is. Um, I do feel like that, that connection with, with the birds though. I mean, you know, even through COVID and I know bird watching has really increased during COVID. Um, but it is such a part of my morning routine as much as like getting up and brushing my teeth is filling the bird feeders for whatever season, whatever food I'm filling. And you don't have hummingbirds, but that's, I'm writing a book about hummingbirds. Um, that's another one. They know they migrate across countries and they come back to the same place and they will, one bird, um, if this is, I share this story in the book I'm working on now. There's a a bird called a broad-tailed hummingbird. And I think of them and my calendar, my nature calendar in my mind is that they come back on tax day, April 15th, and we have to pay taxes. (laughs) And I think, you know, maybe it's just because I'm in a bad mood that day that I look for something to distract me. So I'm always like, that's the day I put out my hummingbird feeder. But Last year, it was about 10 days before tax day. There was no hummingbird feeder out. There were no plants flowering yet. And a broad tail hummingbird was in the exact spot where the hummingbird feeder is supposed to be. It, they know they migrate to an exact spot year after year. And if that is not, I mean, speaking of magic, I know it's also science, but to me, it's magic. (laughs) Uh, That's, that is really, really powerful and beautiful as well. Um, I was in upstate New York for 11 weeks uh, oh. a couple of years ago. And I was, well, my daughter was getting some treatment there, which is another story altogether. But there was one day I was pretty low and I went out into the woods and sat down on this um, little breakfast table or camping table that was there. It was in a national park. And I sat there for a while and I saw a hummingbird and I've never seen one before. Oh, wow. And I was kind of well, it, it went past so quickly. I thought, what was it? Was it a butterfly? Was it a bird? And then I saw it and it was so beautiful. It just made my day. They're really magical. A researcher that I'm um, working or who I'm going to visit who studies hummingbirds, she's in Scotland um, at St. Andrews. Um, but she does her research on hummingbirds. So she comes to Canada for her field season. And she was telling me her biggest 
you know, such a disappointment this year because her students, they just can't wait to see a hummingbird for the first time and to have their field season canceled. Uh, They'll get to go next year, hopefully. But it, yeah. it just, that's what reminded me of seeing those birds for the first time. They're, they're, they're hard to believe they exist. Yes, exactly. And what, what do they feed on or what, what sort of ecosystem are you where you live now? Yeah, um, I'm in the high desert. Um, people think of New Mexico as more of like classic desert, but we're up at 7,000 feet. So we're sort of a transition. Um, you know, you can go to parts where you see more, a little bit of cactus, but I've got in my yard um, trees. <laughs> um so they, they're nectar feeders. You have, what do you have that ha- occupies that niche? I'm not sure, but they're bird, the bird primary lineage of bird pollinators. And, and one that I'm writing about, the Rufus hummingbird has the longest migration per size of any bird. We hear about the godwits and the terns, but you know, these birds are three inches and they migrate from Mexico to Alaska and back again. Oh my Great. goodness. You'd think, yeah. they'd, you'd think they'd be battered around in the winds and, right. you know, they'd arrive with all their feathers kind of battered, <laughs> but they still don't seem to. They don't seem to. Yeah, they're incredible. And so their their fall migration is down through Santa Fe. So they come here after they breed. Um, they show up in around July and okay. they stop over. Yeah. So where are they breeding then? They're breeding as far north as Alaska. I think they okay. breed as far south as Oregon. They have an interesting migration. They go up the west coast of the United States. So they're going up Oregon, California, Washington, but then they come back down the Rocky Mountains. So it's, um, except which is really interesting. I'm finding out the young, the young ones, a lot of them don't do that migration. They come back through the west coast, but the mature ones that have done this before do this sort of circular migration. It's, it's really, that is it's really yeah. How do they it's, know? Incredible. Exa- I know. Exactly. <laughs> Incredible. And what size are their eggs, actually? They must be minute. Oh, my gosh. I know. Um, we actually, it wasn't a rufus, but it was a broad tail, another kind. I actually, you know, you never find the nests. And one nested last spring right above my deck. So I couldn't see the eggs, but the babies, I could see when they first came out. And their beaks, it wasn't even, it was like a piece of thread. That's how small they were like a piece of thread when they when they first. Um, oh goodness. Yeah. How it's, magical. It's yeah. Magical. Your, your, magical. your podcast is appropriately named. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I'm, I can't wait to read the elephant book and I'm looking out for the hummingbird book. as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. um, so your adult book, you wrote about some conservationists. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that one? That sure, very- I'd love to. Yeah, that's called Wild Lives, Leading Conservationists on the Animals and the Planet They Love. Um, that came out in two th- 2017, um, co-authored with Lori Robinson. And we interviewed conservationists around the world that are on the front lines of um, wildlife conservation. And kind of thematically, um, what we what we went into the book asking was, how do you not lose hope? You know, if you're working with polar bears or African elephants or Asian elephants or wolves um, and what can people do? Those were sort of thematically the main questions, but then, um, you know, just their stories, um, great stories of interactions with wildlife. So I think there's 20 chapters. And one of my favorite ones is from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which I I hope to write a book about him at some point um, and his work with gorillas, because it's such a dangerous place. And this man, Dominic Bikaba, um, who's really front lines, you know, it it feels to me that he's probably risking his life given all the conflict there to not just, you know, not just work for the gorillas, but the local people, you know, because their land and protection of their land is protection of them as well. So Mm -hmm. powerful stories. Yeah. You know, I don't know how many people read books like this, but it's what I will keep writing, whether people read them or not. (laughs) Well, I think probably everybody that listens to this podcast does. So (laughs) we'll put we'll put all the books in the show notes. Fabulous. For everybody. Um have you got any positive actions you can suggest for people to support nature or wildlife? Oh I really appreciate that. Um you know I'm a really big fan of small actions matter because I feel that we're all those of us that love nature. um, I know my students, I teach at a community college right now. And, you know, the class is just one bad thing after another in the environmental science class. And I always, always, but we can do this and, and collectively little actions matter. So 
I mean, I think climate change is takes mass, you know, we all need to come together and overthrow anyone that doesn't, you know, work towards making laws and actions. But, you know, I think every action matters. And the one I want to say is our backyards, even if we live in an apartment, wherever we live, a city in, um, you know, here in North America, the monarch butterfly, um, it has been, scientists have looked at this, that if even people plant milkweed, which is their host plant, if all along their corridor, there were, even if you're in a balcony in an apartment, you have a pot with a milkweed, it, it matters. It provides habitat. So I just have to believe my backyard, no pesticides, no chemicals. I've got fresh water, clean, you know, I clean my bird food. I provide local native plants. Um, and I see that it is an ecosystem. Now, I know everybody can't do that, but I feel that everybody could you know, one plant or yeah. one, one less plastic water bottle. I know it doesn't feel like a lot, but I, I have to believe that collectively throughout humanity, it adds up and it matters. Yeah, that's brilliant. The, the milkweed, I think you can sell stories like that. People kind of are flapping around, not knowing what to do. But if right. you have a story that's so clear, you know, this is the path of the butterfly, it needs feed, you know, plant the milkweed. Um, things yeah. like that, you just need to tell people and quite a lot will follow it. It, it. it is very, very difficult. You know, this new program, Seaspiracy, has come out on Netflix and it's meant to be fantastic. And I've only got through the first five minutes. I will watch it. But I can't, you know, looking at the dead whales. Oh, I God. mean, it's oh. just I, yeah. I uh, heartbroken. So I, I have to kind of brace myself and get through that bit. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, I, I really feel like how do we um, how do I as a writer, you know, I feel like when you said that it makes me think of all the things I read, but it feels like the same people are reading the things we already love it like how do I get past that and if you don't mind I just wanted to say you know one of the things I was hoping in this book, um, I didn't mention. It's marketed for nine to 14 year olds. It is no way a just a middle grade book because I always write above my audience, I think it's accessible, but I've. I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but I've had a lot of adults read it that say there's no, I mean, it's filled with facts. It's, it's very accessible, but I chose a younger audience because I feel like sort of across the board, younger people, either they are still reading or they have to read in school, <laughs> you know, and it's an adventure story. So I feel like I'm hoping somehow to break through the just, I already love nature audience to maybe a wider audience that maybe isn't exposed yet. Yeah, I absolutely. This is exactly what I'm trying to do with the podcast. And I feel it is working because it's a positive voice for nature. So we don't dwell on the facts. I mean, there's lots of podcasts out there about what we've lost. And, you know, it's so heartbreaking. But there's so many positive people like you um, that can and, and pe that there's a hunger to learn as well. Um, yes. That people can go, yeah, this is a fun podcast. We're going to, you know, hear about fun things and get some positive actions yes. of what we can do so that's we're on the same page there definitely love that do I have time to say one more positive you action have had time to say as much as you like okay. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to mention this um it, the, my, my Lisa, who introduced me to Dr. Sarma, who I started talking about at the beginning, um, her work has morphed into, you know, exactly positive actions for elephants. So she started Elephant Safe Tea. So um, in that region, it's the largest tea growing region in the world. And I know that in the UK, you drink a lot of tea. <laughs> um, at least my husband does. It's I find his. Yeah. And, and in Ireland, they drink tons <laughs> of tea here. Oh, and in Ireland. Right. Yeah. That's sorry. That was a dumb American thing to no, say. That's <laughs> Fine. <laughs> we love um, our tea. You love your tea. Um, yeah. So Elephant Origins is her website, Elephant Origins. And it, it, I link to it on my website. And it is, she's working with farmers that are leaving um, habitat for the elephants and that are not using pesticides or herbicides. So her tea, you can get on her website. And um, from tea drinkers, I'm told it's delicious. Um, so it's like any sort of fair trade or, you know, something that's stamped to help the environment. Um, it's certified that, you know, buying this tea will help that farmer invest in their land. And if you go on to either my website or her website, you can learn about the farmers. So, so elephant cool. friendly tea. Yeah. And yeah. the website is called Elephant Origins. But Elephant right. Origins. Yes. I just think that's if, if people connecting with the book. 
right? It's so hard to think, how can I possibly help an elephant in the other part of the world? But I, that is her real mission is, you know, by drinking this tea, we can do a little bit. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, I'll put it in the show notes. And my daughter, who's 16, has always loved elephants her whole life. And if she hears about the elephant friendly tea, that will be the only tea she's going to drink. So oh, we're sure cool. to be going on to that website. Oh. And my daughter's 16 too. So Is that's she? another oh, commonality. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we leave the elephants completely, I just wanted to ask, um, did you come across any really amazing elephant fact about how they communicate or how mm. humans communicate with them or some, just something interesting that you came yeah. across on your research? Yes. Um, I mean, I think so much about their communication. I mean, one just you know, isn't necessarily how they communicate, sort of we can communicate with them, but um, they have a 10 octave range of vocalizations they can make. Um, you know, the best singer I've heard is make, can make four. <laughs> um, <laughs> they can recognize with each other hundreds of different individuals. Um, you know, they are contacting with each other through the ground, through the, this infrasonic sounds, and they know each other through their communication. So I think the communication tied into their family bonds is absolutely incredible. Um, You know, and and in terms of communication with people, it's not um, a vocalization, which we think of as communication, but they're very tactile. They're always touching, you know, they're always with their trunks and they're flapping their ears. And again, I don't want to sort of spoil the story totally in case people want to read it. I do think there's a nice emotional arc. But I will say this elephant that um, recognized Dr. Sarma, she gently wrapped her trunk around him. Um, And somebody said, oh my gosh, who was with him, the elephant's, you know, trying to hurt you. He said, no, it's a, it's a hug. It's a hug. So um, that's beautiful. It's it's very, they're very incredible animals. So you were saying that uh, the, the sound they send through the soil, is it? They send through the earth. Yeah. They hear it. They hear it. Yes, yes. But they do hear through their feet that infrasonic rumble. Mm -hmm. Really? So they're picking it up through their feet? Yes. And actually, um, I sort of don't, I feel a little bit like I shouldn't tell the story. um, Because now I think maybe I wouldn't do it again. But Dr. Sarma said it was okay. Um, I do not advocate tourism to ride elephants. I think 99% of the time, it's an abusive situation. And in places like Thailand, now I know they have like, you can go walk with the elephants. Yeah. I did ride an elephant um, and Dr. Sarma was in Kazaranga National Park. He said, you know, he knew the people, he knew the elephants, he knew how the saddles worked and he completely gave me his okay. (laughs) So we did do it. I'm still not sure I would do it again, but I did do it once and I could feel, I could feel that infrasonic rumble. I could feel it shivering through my body. I mean, it was incredible. Just a you know, couldn't really, I couldn't hear it, but I could feel that they must be talking was just this low shivering feeling. Um, Amazing. Cause they do it in their stomach. It's a sort of guttural sound. Some of them. Guttural sound. Right. Exactly. Right. Um, Right. So that was, that was astounding. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, So would you like to tell us some of any of your favorite nature books, if you had time to think about something you might recommend And obviously all of your books, um, we recommend we're going to put them in the show notes for everybody. I appreciate that. Um, Oh, I have so many. Um, I mean, you did have Cy Montgomery. I loved her book about the octopus. I mean, I just, I was, (laughs) I was reading that book on a beach vacation. You know, I look at everybody, what everyone else is reading. I'm like, I'm probably the only one here reading like, you know, everyone else has got their beach books. Um, I love Carl Safina. He blurbed my book, which like took my breath away. Um, I'm reading, oh God, I don't know his new title and I'm reading it right now, but Carl Safina, um, Beyond Words is an absolutely brilliant book. Um, He's a great writer and it's elephants, um, wolves and orcas and it's theory of mind and it's it's just wonderful. Um, I really love Helen McDonnell, um, Vesper Flight, I think I'm saying her name right, and H is for Hawk, who's from England. Yeah, I read that. Vesper Flights, I think, is incredible. I like that kind of writing. Um, 
that's narrative nonfiction, which is what I'm doing in the Hummingbird book where the author is actually a part of the book, the story. And the last one I'll mention right now because her writing's just blowing me away. Her name is Kathleen Dean Moore. And her new book is, I think it's called Wild Music. I'm not exactly sure. Um, it's, it's about what we will lose as we lose sort of the music of the earth. But it's not... It's not the depressing dead whale book. It's really um, just beautiful, her experiences in the natural world and the music of the natural world. That sounds like a beautiful collection of books. Thank you so yeah. much. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm asking. sure the listeners will appreciate that. Um, so if you had a magic wand, what would you like to do for the planet? Oh, gosh. Um, oh, how many, how many swipes of it do I get? You, might, you can get a couple. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I don't know, like this one is just that the swipe is like we're stopping the extinction crisis. Like I know that 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 would like take care of everything else because I feel like it would take care of habitat loss and climate change. But I just love animals so much. Um, I, I can't I can't mm, I can't live with this. Ex- I mean, I just I don't know. I don't have the words. Um, so I'm waving my magic wand and we're just stopping the extinction crisis and everything's going to sort of come back, you know, and that will take care of everything else. Thank so that's you. That's for. one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did you want to have another go? Well, we'll stop climate, you know, anthropomorphic climate change, um, of course, because that needs to stop. We need to stop our carbon building of the atmosphere. Um I think those are the two big, I mean, gosh, you know, we're going to live more simply. We're, we're going to use less resources, but I think that like those two big ticket items are going to start bringing us back into balance. Thank you, Janie, so much. Um, great inspiration and suggestions and really thank you so much. I can't wait to look at your book. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, I'm, I'm honored. Yes, so welcome. You're so welcome. Um, so, Janie, if anybody wanted to contact you, what would be the best way? Um, yeah, through my website. And my website is my name, but I'll spell that out because my first or my last name are not <laughs> obvious. <laughs> so that is www.janie, Kodish, C-H, o d o s h dot com janiecodish.com and i have a contact me page links to all my books links to elephant tea links to some other elephant organizations great thank you thank you for listening to nature magic the podcast is a child of the pandemic as we would not have had the time to launch it without the lockdowns so that's one positive from this situation which has been very difficult for everyone It has been rewarding connecting with our inspirational guests. Thank you for your input. We look forward to talking to many more and spreading a positive voice for nature around the planet. For locals that listen in, the main news this week is that Borough Nature Sanctuary will not be reopening in 2021. Restrictions will be lifted soon, but unfortunately, after being closed for over a year, it is not as simple as just opening the doors. Although the future is uncertain, we will be continuing with all our eco-projects, including the National Collection of Borough Flora in partnership with the National Native Seed Bank, our native tree planting project that resumes in the autumn, and our podcast. All our farm pets and rescue animals will remain with us. Amelia the pig is still enjoying doing Zoom school tours, bookable on our website, and is restarting her famous Fairy Pig Walks, that are bookable through Airbnb experiences. So many people are doing wonderful things for nature and the environment. Thank you for your work.